All right, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kirk Carnets. I'm uh, with ESD, and I'm the vice president of our Chicago Cornet chapter. Uh, Lauren Bagel, who is our chapter president, is not able to join us today. She's off um, enjoying some well-deserved time off. Um, on behalf of her, um, the board of directors, and our programs committee, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone here today for today's exciting program. Um, the program is titled Being in the Zoom Room, Where It Happens, Discussing Successes in the Workplace by Leveraging Diversity of Thought. Um, before we um, get into it, I want to thank our sponsors, our diamond sponsors, our end users, our platinum gold uh, and silver sponsors, as well as all of our individual members and our, our guests here today. Without our sponsors and our members, programs like this and programs that um, have occurred throughout the year, um, would just not be possible. So thank you all um, for uh, your sponsorship and participation and membership as well. And if there's guests on today, I hope today's program, if this is your first, um, will help um, you identify um, with Cornet and um, see the value that we bring, um, not just in our programs, but across the breadth of the network um, of the organization itself. Uh, we've got a big program, so I just wanna quickly um, identify some of our upcoming events. We do have next week um, from four to five, kind of a, um, an unusual um, format for our sponsorship and appreciation um, networking event. Um, and so if you haven't um, uh, signed up, please do. I think it's gonna be an interesting uh, format. We've got some guest speakers and cameos um, that are a little bit um, off the Zoom beaten path, uh, so to speak. And so um, I'm excited to see what's gonna happen there. Um, October 26th and 27th, uh, the virtual summit. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to register and you have the ability um, to do so financially, um, take a look at the, the, the program um, and uh, you'll see it's as rich as ever, uh, despite it being virtual. So I encourage you to take a look at that and sign up if it's possible for you. At the end of the month, we have another program, uh, Technology in the Workplace, uh, with some great speakers and, uh, around technology, prop tech, um, and what's happening. Um, in response to COVID and, and how we see um, things moving forward in, in this new world. And then December 9th, um, we will be having um, our virtual uh, Let's Get Real Awards. Um, we are uh, announcing tomorrow, I believe, or uh, yeah, it should be tomorrow, the different categories. And this year's Real Awards are a little bit different in that we're trying to acknowledge um, exemplary um, contributions um, of the industry and all of our partners here in Coordinat around COVID and the response to COVID. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to Diana Pisoni to introduce our program today and our, our, uh, our lineup of speakers. Diana. Hi everyone, great to kind of see you in uh, tiny little boxes. Um, as Kurt mentioned, I'm Diana Pisoni. I'm with Ted Ludus Associates. I'm former chair of programs and now um, very excited uh, programs committee member. And as we were talking about, uh, this is uh, our traditionally our Women's Month program that was supposed to be held in uh, March, but due to the unforeseen activities across the globe, uh, we canceled it, postponed it, and here we are rebooting it about diversity, inclusion in the workplace, as well as in thought leadership. And our moderator for today is Renee Bradshaw. Renee is the head of real estate for Kirkland and Ellis, and her career uh, began with a very interesting pathway with starting out uh, with um, a degree in journalism due to her thirst for fact finding, which transcended into uh, a path down consulting and then eventually into corporate interiors, which morphed into commercial real estate. And now she uses all of those experiences to help bring uh, strategic solutions to Kirkland and Ellis. So my cohort and coronet, as well as my friend, Renee Bradshaw. Diana, thank you so much. That sounds like a really varied background, but uh, there are some common threads through there, um, but that's a different program. Um, I want to introduce our dynamic and completely awesome panel that I'm excited to share with you. Um, let me start with uh, Dan Chong. Dan is the president of HBF and HBF Textiles. He joins us from Charlotte. He's had an esteemed career in the contract manufacturing business where he joined Metro Furniture and was instrumental in creating transformative workplace products and ultimately climbed the ranks within Metro to become the president and CEO of that entity. 
he was also a key player in the Steelcase Design Partnership that became Coalesce. And Dan is going to open uh, this conversation in just a few minutes with a research presentation that he launched in his own organization about diversity and particularly the inclusion of women in teams with a historical look at evolution. Uh, but before Dan launches, I'd like to introduce our other two panelists. Um, next, Erin Murray Butler, our own Chicago colleague, and many of you know Erin. Uh, she's shared some of her success stories with us in the past. Erin is a partner at William Blair and head of workplace and real estate management. Um, she, you may not know that Erin is the only woman partner and not on the uh, revenue generation side of her business. So she's going to talk to us about how she's elevated her shared services organization, including real estate, to be a critical element within William Blair. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Taya Cook. Taya is the Director of Development at Urban Capital. She was actually the first employee at Urban Capital in Toronto. She oversees many of the firm's developments and a portfolio of more than 3.7 billion. Um, interesting story, we got uh, acquainted when Teo was highlighted in a Wall Street Journal article for a development that she led in Toronto with an all-female team. So she's going to share uh, her inspiration about the Reina development in particular uh, and, and what was different about that project. So a super exciting panel and stories to tell. Um, Right before I turn it over to Dan, I just want a, a housekeeping issue. If you guys have any questions uh, while the speakers, uh, while Dan is giving his presentation or while we're having some conversation after, just put them in the chat box and we'll monitor them and we'll get to your questions uh, later in the hour. So with that, Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Okay, can all of you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Want to make sure that works. So thank you, everyone. And, and I'm really pleased and flattered to be asked to, uh, to share this presentation with you. <clears throat> As a quick preface, uh, for, the, uh, for the women in the audience, I think you're going to be really pleased with the content. For the men in the office, obviously, that would include myself. I will tell you that we're going to be a little humble. <laughs> okay. So this is research that I have gathered over probably uh, at least a decade, and I finally put it all together in really trying to help um, organizations understand the evolution of what's happening around the world and how it will ultimately impact, impact the workplace. Um, uh, let's see, does not want to advance, okay. There are five key, what I would call megatrends that have been happening in, the, uh, in our country, in the world. And um, we all talk about trends, but these in my mind are megatrends. They, they're transformative trends. And what's important to think about with each one of these trends is each one had to happen in order for the next to happen. So they actually built upon one another. So the five trends are first, the fall of empires, the rise of democracies, our shift from, from an agrarian or agricultural uh, society to an industrial one. We then have moved from physical to cognitive work. Uh, we then have moved from static uh, to mobile personal technology. And then lastly, and where the premise of this presentation is, all of these trends have enabled the rise of women and minorities in the workplace, okay? So I'm gonna to touch on each one of these trends pretty quickly. The first is the fall of empires, the rise of democracies. So it, it may be startling for, for us to remember that in the early 1800s, only 1% 1 of the world practiced some form of democracy. The United States was one of them, but we were very much of the few. Around the world, the dominant governmental structure were kingdoms or autocracies. That has changed to now democracies dominate uh, the form of government around the world. So you can see that 
line of the blue line of how democracies have rise since the, uh, since the 1800s to 2020, okay? There is a fundamental reason for that. When a government moves from more of a kingdom or a hierarchy to a democracy, there is a radical shift in gross domestic product. There's a radical shift in wealth. So you can see from this chart, the blue bubbles are full democracies. And you want to be in a country, you want to be in that upper right quadrant. Those are the wealthiest nations, most developed nations in the world. And it is not by chance that it is dominated by a democratic form of government. The one outlier, so that pink, uh, sort of that dark pink uh, small bubble up toward the top in the upper left, the one exception to this has been Singapore. But if you really study Singapore, they are actually a hybrid between a kingdom and a democracy. You can see on the lower bottom left, if you, if you have more an authoritarian form of government, you are a poorer nation than if you were a democracy. So this is why we've seen the shift globally uh, since the 1800s toward the democracy. Um, because uh, we moved to a democracy, then we moved from an agrarian culture to a manufacturing culture. Again, this was not enabled until we became a democracy and we took on a more democratic form of government. So if you look at the lower left picture, when we are an agrarian society, our, our full-time job was farming our land. Okay, we, we farmed our land, we grew our, we grew our, our food, we ate our food, um, and that was a full-time job. And it was only through a democracy that we became a manufacturing-centered uh, uh, nation, where we know that we had a migration of farmlands into cities. It was this migration that actually built cities like all of you, I think, are in. So you can see that in the chart. So we moved from the grand society in the uh, 1800s, 70 percent to less than 2.1 percent. Uh, it's actually now less in 2020. And as all of you know, because of technology and agriculture, we actually produce more food than we can, we can consume, okay? So you can see in the bump in the 1940s, we bumped to a manufacturing-based uh, um, country. And as we know, we are actually producing more output in manufacturing with fewer, fewer plants uh, through, through the rise of technology, okay? The third major trend is the movement of technology. Um, so we all know that the impact that te technology has on our life. But what's more important is understand that technology in general increasingly becomes more mobile and more personal or intimate. So one kind of fun example of that, I'm going to assume that the majority of people on this call listening to this presentation own a water bottle. And if you think about why do you own a water bottle, you can buy you know, a plastic bottle. It's a certainly functional uh, way to carry water. But why do people buy a water bottle? We know that in fact, people buy a water bottle because it's a personal statement. It's an intimate statement about you as a person. And that's a very strong drive. Um, as we all, you know, a more obvious example is, we, we all have smartphones, but now they're a statement. So we care about the way they look. We care about the kind of package we put them in. They become intimate and personal. What we know that has happened here is it has displaced the workplace. So we know now that technology now, our work is carried with us and it's more intimate and personal because it's also not just an extension of work, but it's an extension of our personal lives. So that's had a profound impact on the workplace. Um, so all of this has caused a rise in the participation of women in the workplace. You can see that women have grown as a percentage of the workplace and men have shrunk. 
What's interesting is this year, January of 2020, we hit a milestone that there are more women in the workplace today than men, okay? The premise behind this is that when we were an agricultural-based society and a manufacturing-based society, work was, be, work was much associated with physical strength. Right? When you were working in a factory, we generally had very few women working in factory because you had to, had to be a certain size and physical strength to, to do that kind of work. When work is shifted to cognitive work, the premise is what inherent advantage does a man have over a woman when it's cognitive work? And the obvious answer is none. <laughs> so it, it's not when you step back and think about this, it's not surprising that women are rising as a percentage of the total workforce because women and men are equals when it comes to cognitive work. Men hold no advantage. Now it's gonna get a little more interesting on the comparison of women, women and men when I move further in this presentation. The other thing that's happening in our country and around the world is the rise of, of minorities in the workplace. So you can see that already, uh, you can see the growth of Blacks, Hispanics, Asians in the workplace because we, uh, minorities are representing a higher percentage of the population in the United States and around the world. So we will continue to see not, the, not only the rise of women in the workplace, but minorities in the workplace. And when women and minorities in the workplace are a majority, they will have a profound impact on the way workplaces are designed and the way work culture is, is manifested. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, I'll admit, I do love um, Marvel comic movies. Um, I know I'm not alone because they tend to be blockbusters. But the other reason why I put the slide together is that movies are a reflection of the culture, of our pop, pop culture and what is happening around us. In 2017, the movie Wonder Woman was launched. It was historic because it was the first movie uh, that had a female lead, clearly just a female lead, directed by a woman and it became the sixth most successful movie in 2017, and it is the 66th most successful movie of all time. It is the most successful um, uh, woman-led movie that was directed by a woman. Why is that important? Because up until this point, Hollywood would not fund a movie with a female lead directed by a woman. So it's re representative of a, of a cultural shift in our country where Hollywood would bet millions of dollars that we're at this time in our country's history, well, this will be a success. It wasn't just a success. It was a blockbuster. The year after that, in 2018, um, the studios invested in a movie called The Black Panther. It was also a, a black male lead in an almost entirely black cast, and the director was also black. It was also a hugely successful film. So to me, these are important because they represent a cultural shift in our country around accepting black and women uh, as equals. We also know the 116th Congress was, was historic because there's more women in Congress in both the Democratic and Republican parties than the history of our country. This will continue. This will, we will continue to see a rise of women in politics. Obviously, we all know what's going on with the reelection right now. That's another historic moment in our country's history. Now, why do I believe this will continue? We have seen a pretty steady migration, I would admit, it needs to be faster, but a pretty steady migration of female CEOs. Uh, we did take a step back in 2016. It's now on the rise again in 2020. So obviously women are rising as CEOs and organizations and senior leadership uh, positions while men are falling. 
we will continue to see this uh, trend upward. In fact, my premise is we will continue to see this trend not continue to go up for women, but it will accelerate. And the reason it will accelerate is this. Today, there are more women getting advanced degrees, both college degrees and post-college degrees than men. And this will be a trend. So you can see the trend. There are more women in college and more women uh, doing post-undergraduate uh, post work than men. These will be and continue to be the future leaders of our organizations. So in this slide, I wanted to kind of break some myths and I'm not gonna go through each one of those, uh, each one of these, but there were some really interesting statistics that kind of um, surprised me, candidly. Um, in the last major recession, not the one that we're going through now, but the last economic recession in 2007, um, corporations that had women on the boards experienced 14% higher profit gro growth than all male boards. There's also this premise that uh, there has been this premise, this myth that, uh, well, if there's one area that men excel in, it's math, math and economics. So uh, mathematics and economics, um, women, uh, men are actually superior to women. Well, as it turns out, that's not actually true. Uh, female CFOs were found to negotiate bank loans with 11% lower pricing and longer terms than men, okay? We all know that now, I think if you're reading up on this, men do not have a superior mathematical brain than men. Women have been discouraged in the past to study math, the sciences. I don't think that's any longer true. And we're, just, and we're finding out that women are just as competent men in the sciences. Um, the last one I'd touch on, the International Monetary Fund did a study and they said eliminating, eliminating gender gaps in work and pay will increase average country GDP growth from five, anywhere from five to 34%. That number is astounding. I had to read that study several times to make sure that they were actually, that was actually, that was true. Five to 34% increase in average GDP is stunning. What that is telling us is that putting more women in senior leadership positions will help the world become wealthier and a better place. Then this one touches all of us. This is early studies, um, but it's in we won't know the conclusion of this until the pandemic is behind us, but there are early studies, this is from the Harvard Business Review, that women-led countries are managing the pandemic better than the countries led by men. Now again, we're in the midst of this, we all know, this study is not conclusive, but it's important enough that people are starting to pay attention and as credible sources as the Harvard Business Review is starting to study this and track. Are women in leadership positions actually handle crisis, crises like the pandemic better than men? So what I did is then I said, why is this? What are the genetic differences, physical differences, cognitive differences between men and women. Are we equals? As I said, now that we're doing cognitive work, um, are we truly equals? Um, because men, have, you know, our physical size is no longer an advantage. And this is where it was actually a little more humbling to me than I anticipated. So we all know in the first one that men are bigger and stronger. So I said, okay, can feel good about that as a man. We're bigger and we're stronger. We run faster. That's great. Until I found out that women actually heal faster than men and live longer. <laughs> so I think as a man, I'd rather heal faster and live longer than be a little stronger than a woman. Um, this is where it's, it would, uh, I'd love to see your reaction, but in physical and in emotional maturation. So when the women in the audience, when you were dating, uh, your significant other partner, and you wondered if, um, if you know, at times we acted like children. Uh, the actual truth is we are. Um, men mature, reach full maturity slower than women, okay? 
So typically men reach full maturity, physical and emotional maturity at age 43. Women reach that maturity at age 32. So we are 11 years behind you. So you really do have to excuse all our crazy behavior when you were, <laughs> when we were probably dating. Thought processing, uh, just really quickly, men can focus, we tend to have tunnel vision. Um, this was important. So when we were in, uh, you know, uh, prehistoric times and we were focused on, on hunting the bear and bringing the bear back uh, so that uh, the tribe could eat, we really did not notice that there was a lion stalking uh, in, you know, on the side that could potentially kill us. Because if, we, if, if men were wired that way, we would never eat. That's the, the premise of anthropologists. A kind of a funny way to take a look at this if your husband or your significant male other is watching the Super Bowl and you ask him a question and it sounds like he's ignoring you, he's probably not really ignoring you. He's focused on the game and he's tuned out everything else but the game. Okay, it's the same when, if, when uh, for some of you that have children and um, the baby's crying at night and you know those of you that are women, you wake up in the middle of the night and say, "Honey, do you hear that?" The baby's crying and he may say, no, I don't hear what you're hearing, okay? Because you guys, women uh, are more, there's a stronger connection between the right and left parts of your brain. You multitask better than we do. In reality, what you can do is shift between your right and left parts of your brain far faster than men. You are more aware of how your sounds. You are more aware of moving around you. Men, again, have tunnel vision. Um, men track movement been better than women. Um, women, on the other hand, um, you um, see depth better than we do, and you actually see more colors than men. Uh, men tend to be colorblind, women are not. Uh, this is what I thought was interesting. Um, in a British study, they were trying to understand how much of this is genetic and how much of it is, you know, the nature versus nurture conversation. Um, so they gave children, they gave little girls, uh, these were young girls before they could, we believe, before they could be fully formed in terms of um, nurture. They gave little girls trucks and they gave little boys uh, dolls. And then they videotaped on how they played with them. And these were very young children. And what they found in the studies that by and large, the little boys took the dolls and they fought each other with them and used them as swords. The little girls took the trucks and they carried them like babies, they washed them and they nurtured them. So this is one of the early studies to suggest it is what they believe, we believe these studies uh, indicate that this is much more nature versus nurture. Now that's not conclusive, but it certainly is pointing in that direction. Um, men do not use verbal expression as well as women. Um, uh, men are much more action oriented. Women are much more thoughtful and express their feelings much more openly than men. Um, so, so these are some of the uh, genetic differences between men and women. So what these studies conclude, it points to that women are naturally more collaborative, empathetic, and compassionate than men. It doesn't mean that men can't learn this. It does not mean that men are not these things. But if you look at the general averages, women are stronger in collabor collaboration, empathy, and compassion than men are on average. So I read this really interesting book uh, several years ago by Ori, um, Ori Braffman and Rod Beckstrom. And they're basically, they were talking about the organizations of the future and the book is called The Starfish and the Spider. And if their premise was, if you look at a starfish and a spider, physically they look very similar. But the reason they use these metaphors is they said, if you cut off the spider's head, what happens, or it dies. If you cut off a starfish's leg, doesn't have a head, right? If you cut off a starfish's leg, it grows back. 
they used these metaphors because they said the, org the most successful organizations of the future will be led by an ideology. It will not be led by a single person. It'll be led by an ideology and the organization will share that ideology. Every in the organization will share this common sense purpose and this common sense of where the organization is going. And they painted this picture of the organizations of the future will be servant leaders. So the current organizations, they said, and this, was, this book was about 10 years old, they called it the spider organization. Uh, the CEO is the boss and it's a very much command and control kind of environment. We have one person at the top of the organization who tells everyone else what they need to do. The information, information flows up to the CEO and then the CEO dictates what needs to happen. Essentially, as you guys probably can imagine, their premise is this is an outdated model. The future model is a, is a chief executive servant, is a coach. The organization is network. All the information flows around one another. Uh, it is highly collaborative. It's highly democratic. Um, the CEO is about learning, teaching, coaching, and, counsel and counseling, and moving the entire direction of the organization around a shared common vision and common purpose. And if you think about the organizations today that are most successful, that has already emerged. Okay. So my premise is then, if that is the organization of the future, if that's the kind of leadership the organizations of the future need to embrace, who are better, men or women, at that kind of leadership? So what I looked at is boiling down uh, through a number of studies, McKinsey was a big one, but a num number of management studies about what does successful leadership look like today and in the future? And these were the traits. The leadership had to demonstrate high levels of emotional and social intelligence, the ability to inspire, inspire the organization, the desire to develop talent within the organization through the utilization of soft power, um, the ability to develop and effectively lead, or, lead organizations through, um, through team and collaboration, um, willingness to address difficult issues, and the ability to perform effectively under ambiguous and uncertain circumstances. So of all the management studies that I read, these were where I pulled out as the six key traits of successful leadership in the, in the future. So question is, who's better at these six traits, men or women? Unfortunately for me, it's women. Women actually excel at four of these better than men there's only two genetic studies would suggest that men are good at are equals with women. The one where men are slightly better than women is the, the, our willingness to address difficult issues. That's the only one where men show a slight better performance than women. But overall, women are the right genetic um, are genetically wired to lead organizations in the future. So the final slide to this is what the studies really suggest and the most successful organizations of the future are ones where men and women work as equals, where we are embracing the natural propensities and strengths of each other regardless of our gender, but to truly embrace that men and, we, men and women need to be seen as equals in the workplace with an equal voice, uh, an equal amount of weight in what we do. And there's a lot of great examples of this, but the one I wanted to pull was Marty and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I think we all know uh, a lot about how Marty supported Ruth uh, in it, and she would absolutely credit that because of their sense of equality in their marriage, he helped Ruth become one of the, great, one of the great, greatest uh, Supreme Court justices we've known. So that's it, you guys. I am going to turn it back over to the panel. 
Thanks, Dan. That was, uh, I mean, from my perspective, of course, uh, you're right on. Naturally, I would say that. <laughs> uh, for, the, for the men in the audience, maybe that seemed a little harsh, but I think your <laughs> overall message uh, is more about equality and inclusion. Um, I, I know that's the spirit. So I, I want to turn it over to, um, in particular, I'm going to pose a question and start with Taya. Taya, if you want to wave in the Hollywood Square, there you go. Um, because um, I'm getting that uh, a lot about Dan's presentation resonated with you because you put together an all-female team to lead a development, which was uh, and and still remains a pretty unique thing. So I want to I want you to talk a little bit about your inspiration and maybe what resonates with you from what Dan just talked about. Definitely, and thank you, Dan. I mean, one of the the best parts of doing these types of talks is meeting the men who are totally on board and completely supportive. And I think that's really what's needed in order to shift industries and to just move forward. And I know you said, you know, the men might feel uncomfortable watching this. I, as a woman, felt uncomfortable hearing it because I can't believe we're still talking about this or just trying to justify that women are actually equally as smart. I mean, come on. <laughs> so I think, thank you. I think that was great. And so to your question, Renee, yes. So quickly about my backstory is here in Toronto, there was an article that came out uh, that said, here are the top 20 developers in the city. And it was all men. And I've worked with Urban Capital, which is a development firm here in Toronto for the last 16 years. And I thought that is just so discouraging for a woman in the industry to look at who are all the top leaders and not have anybody there who's representing them or that you can look up to in that sense. I thought, you know what, let's do a project where it is 100% women, just to counteract that, to show that there are women in this industry, to give other women the opportunity to work with other women, because many of us have only worked, you know, we've always been the only woman in the boardroom. So by doing this project, it's not only opened up that conversation to say, hey, how can we get more women into this industry so that we can balance things out a bit, but also to have the conversation of, is it any different when there are women who are the head decision makers in a project? And what does that look like for the project going forward? So I'm going to be mindful of time, but, um, but Taya, can you talk a little bit about what was different as that, as that unfolded? And, um, and for the group, I just have to say that, you know, when we were at, at that last supper so long ago on March 11th, um, that uh that Taya talked about uh the fact that you know she picked up this magazine she got inspired saying you know there's plenty of women in development why aren't they visible and you tell the story that you uh you you took it to your team and they said we'll do something about it right yeah. it, it, rather casually yeah and what was great about that is you know the owners of urban capital it's two men they were happened to be on that top 20 list and, you know, instead of coming into the office and saying, oh, congratulations, this is great. I said, this is outrageous. You know, we have to do something. And, and they're fabulous. They said, yeah, you're right. Go do something. You know, no question about it. We bought the site probably about two weeks later. And we had an all-female team within about a month and a half. So it really moved quickly. And what I think is compelling about that is that it's not something we set out to do. It wasn't a long plan of something. It really was a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, to what the reality is in this industry and that it is for the vast majority mostly men, uh, especially when you're looking at the senior levels. And so in terms of what that's meant for the project, so this has been about two years now we've been working on it and it's a condominium building. It's a mid rise, nine stories, 200 units, about 150 million Canadian dollars, <laughs> uh, just to give you a feel of the scale of the project. And so we've been working yeah, for the last two years and it is very different. I mean, when you take a group of women who, like I said, are accustomed to working with just men for the most part and put them all together, you really feel the difference in the energy. And it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's a positive thing or a negative thing, it's just different. The way that we talk to each other is different. The way that we collaborate, like Dan said, is very different. Uh, the conversations you have at the beginning of the meeting tend to be much more personal. You know, what happened over the weekend? How are your kids doing? But 
it became very relevant because at the end of the day, at least on our end, we're developing residential units. And so a lot of those conversations can really inform uh, what the product ends up being. And that's sort of the piece that gets that personal aspect tends to get left out of a lot of developments. So I feel that our process and what we've come up with in terms of design is different and differentiates from the market. Thank you. Erin, I'd, I'd like to hear from you a little bit. Um, so you uh, work in a uh, definitely uh, a male dominated world in investment banking, that's no secret. And you um, not only have a seat at the table, but you also uh, brought real estate um, to have a seat at the table in what some organizations look at as, you know, an, an, an overhead versus an investment. So talk to us a little bit about how you elevated um, yourself and, and your organization within William Blair. Yeah, sure. First, thanks all for having me today. Very exciting. And Dan, great presentation. It was really great to see. Um, you know, just quickly, I, you know, when I graduated from college, I, I started working in a nonprofit. And I, it, it's weird, because I never thought that I would work in nonprofit, but it's probably the best thing that happened to me for my career now that I look back. Um, because I was working for the CFO and someone donated a 56,000 square foot carbon building and said, you can have it. Um, and so we said, okay, we'll turn it into a community center. And the CFO said, you can run it. <laughs> and I was 22 and had no idea what I was doing. Um, <clears throat> but they didn't have any money and I was interested in, in working hard. So I was able to manage and facilitate this conversion uh, and create this uh, help create this um, really wonderful community center, um, which was the baseline for my career. And then when I moved to Chicago um, and, and started working in corporate real estate and design and construction, um, I feel like I've had the opportunity to work in the best of both worlds, bringing the nonprofit viewpoint, which has so much to do with diversity and inclusion, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute, but more importantly, bringing, I think, that education into the corporate environment, but then having the resources that were necessary uh, helped tremendously. And uh, I came to William Blair about 12 years ago and uh, was really intrigued by the organization. I came from a much larger company, but was asked to help facilitate the, the relocation of the corporate headquarters. And I had read so much about the firm and how great it was, but also, um, you know, that it was an older firm and, you know, maybe set in their ways. And I thought, well, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Um, but when I, when I walked into the organization, I really fell in love with the culture uh, and the people. And it took a long time, but building a level of trust and communication with all of the different business leaders gave me a tremendous opportunity uh, to help facilitate um, in a, a program and a design to, to build our corporate headquarters in Chicago. And then, of course, after moving in, and, and although it's primarily vacant right now, um, it, it just was uh, recognized. And I'm, I'm proud to say that it, uh, it was recognized enough that not only was I part of the discussion leading up to it, but continue to be part of the thoughtful discussions uh, as it relates to the firm. So that's my story. Thank you. You know, you touched um, you touched on diversity and inclusion uh, when you were when you were telling your story. How do you incorporate uh, diversity of thought, uh, diverse people, inclusiveness? How do you promote that in your work? So uh, in a lot of ways, and I, going back to my working in nonprofit and social service, I had this responsibility because we've received a lot of public dollars for our construction work. Um, there were a lot of requirements and I think I carried that with me. Um, and it's always been a part of who I am. We're fortunate at William Blair we, where we have a, a dynamic uh, head of diversity and inclusion uh, that helps us. But more importantly, it's about the relationships 
uh, with the different vendors and consultants that you're working with and having those conversations up front and making sure that um, you're, you're taking an active approach in how um, you're partnering with people and organizations and companies. And it, it does take work because you have to think about it in advance. Um, and when you develop those partnerships though, the level of support and what you get back, I think has been so tremendous. Um, it's, it's helped us greatly, but things like building in MBE, DBE language in some of our proposals has been extremely helpful. And sometimes there's a cost associated with it, but I think it's a well invested uh, cost. And I do find um, that our partnerships have been strong and solid and, and we've seen these, these, some of these companies really blossom and develop. Thank you, Erin. Um, Dan, I, I want to turn back to you uh, because obviously this, this, uh, this whole idea was something you became inspired by. And I know similar to Erin and Taya, you uh, have sought um, for diversity in, in your projects and in your work. Um, but what is, you know, once you started to uncover this research and really get into it and start to uh, get more granular with it, how did it change how you lead within your own organization or um, encourage others to be leaders? Um, so thanks, Renee. I, I would say that at HBF, um, we do have a number of women on my senior leadership team. And, uh, you know, as, as, as we've talked about, I do think that um, the dynamic is different. It's more open. It's more collaborative. Um, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I mean, this may sound silly, but it's, it's more relaxed and people pay attention. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it, having been in meetings or, or led an organization, I led one where it was largely men. Um, it was shorter, more abrupt, more, let's get, you know, okay, let, you know, let's, let's decide what we need to do and uh, let's just go get it done. And, um, and uh, I have to say there was a little more ego in the room than where I have a lot of women now on my senior leadership team. And um, I, you know, so having had those experiences, I firmly believe that we make better decisions because of it. And it's because it's men and women in the room making decisions. They're more thoughtful. I think they're more well thought out. And I think we make better decisions. Um, so I have experienced it. Um, and, you know, it was partly what prompted me to say, I can't be alone, okay? To really understand what is the dynamic. And, it, you know, and now we're seeing it a lot, right? Um, where we're just seeing the importance of the female voice, the woman's voice, the woman's point of view. And to me now, having done the research, it's sort of like, yeah, <laughs> you know, how do we accelerate this? You know, because it's just better. It's just better. Well, you know, that is an interesting question. How do we accelerate this? Because there's been so much written in the midst of this pandemic about, the toll that will be taken on women's careers um, in, in many different ways. You know, uh, CNBC launched a report uh, in July. There's been a number of headlines. I've seen Harvard Economist has commented upon it that because, um, because women uh, tend to be the main caregiver in the home, they tend to be the person that um, oversees the schoolwork, and now that's happening in the home environment for many of us who are working at home. Uh, that's going to have a major impact. Um, you know, if you look in other sectors, other than the, the folks primarily on this call, um, that, you know, women typically uh, work in some of the lower uh, uh, lower paid sectors and certainly have already experienced layoffs. So, you know, it kind of feels like this may, uh, this pandemic may uh, 
take us a step back, which wouldn't be good based on the stats you shared overall with how much better economies do when women participate. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, all right, so Renee, great question. I'm going to be super candid. <laughs> I hope that's okay. I think there's two things, two things come to mind. I think that there is systematic bias against women that has to become, has to erode. Um, um, you know, essentially when you look around and you say, okay, women are making progress, but it's slow. By and large, we, the organizational leadership, corporations are still dominated by men. Men have to be willing to give up power and willing to understand that there's systematic discrimination against women in senior leadership roles. We, and and all, of, all the women on the call know this, you experience it every day, right? So it's willing to confront and say it's real. The second thing to me is men have to, under, have to put their ego aside and say, I will run a better company when I have women in senior leadership roles. The evidence is there and men have to be willing to say, I have to put my company first and my company will be better if I continue to promote women in senior leadership roles. And maybe the next person in my organization needs to be a women CEO. The evidence is there. Men just can't be threatened by it and do the best they can for their organizations and put their ego aside. Well, you know, I, um, I, what you're saying definitely resonates um, with me personally. And, it, and I know that earlier this year, I can't remember if it was during the pandemic or right before, Goldman Sachs actually um, noted that they were not going to, uh, you're, you're, can you say it, Dan? You're, you're nodding your head. Yeah, they, Goldman Sachs made a statement. They are no longer going to underwrite any IPOs unless the women, unless there's a mix of women and men on the board. Did it go even, did, was, it, was it men and women or was it a more diversity in general? I'm not well, even I sure. I think it might've been diversity. I actually had yeah. that in the, in the presentation, but I pulled it out. So I was trying to be a little Yeah, yeah, we were getting, yeah. But I thought that was, uh, I mean, that, that is real, that is real, um, that is real change uh, from my perspective. That's, a, that's addressing some systematic change. Absolutely, Renee, absolutely. Those are, and you think about Goldman Sachs, that is one of the old guard. Right. Um, so when Goldman Sachs can sort of see the light, there's hope that things are fundamentally shifting. Whoops. Can I, are you guys, am I still with you guys? Yep. Yep. I can see you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. I'm having uh, some technical difficulty. Um, as we move, uh, as we move up to the top of the hour, I was trying to check and see if we had any questions in the chat box um, from from the audience, um, and I, I don't see any. But uh, I just wanted to to open that comment up to the audience so that you can uh, feel free to pose a question. It's a really informal group, so happy to have anyone uh, jump in uh, with anything that might have resonated with you. Maybe I'll just jump in with what Dan had just said too, is I think that um, if I'm trying to think of it from a male perspective, I would not be thrilled at the thought of having to give up power or step myself back. Or, I mean, as a woman, I, that doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> I think that what, you, what you're saying though is also, it's recognizing that we're on the wave of a major change in the way that we do business. And it's a huge opportunity for both men and women to jump on board together and say, hey, how can we make these companies better? So it's not about stepping back or, mm -hmm. or putting your own career to the side to make way for this one woman who's taking your place. I think it's an opportunity to come together and say, hey guys, how can we all do this better together? How can we make our company stronger, just like you said? And how can we grow together into this new wave? You know, it's like jumping on to technology or jumping on to, uh, you know, any of the movements that we've had in the past, now's the time to jump. So I would suggest to all the men, this is not a negative against you. This is a very positive movement that's happening for all of us. And hopefully we can go forward with that energy in a positive way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for so eloquently summing that up, Taya. I think that uh, um, great point. And uh, I, I see so many people uh, chiming in on the on the chat and saying it's not a zero sum game and and bravo and enjoying this discussion. So I want to thank you all for flying to Chicago for a presentation that didn't happen and then also <laughs> joining us now again today so many months later i think that um you know when we're all back together again um i would love to revisit this because this is uh, an evolving story and uh i think it's for me personally it's hard to present this way dan you mentioned it that you don't get the the visuals mm -hmm. of, of people's faces in the same way so um I want to thank everyone for spending an hour with us today. Um, thank our panel for putting this together. And it was great to see so many of you again, even if it was the Hollywood Square style. <laughs> 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 I hope maybe we can do this again next year when we're back, we're back in the room where it happens and not the Zoom where it happens. Yes. That'd be great. Thanks, That'd Renee. Be great. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you, Renee. everyone. Great job. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.